Okay, now the next um, article on the agenda is Judaism and the Environment by Man from Gerstenfeld. So um, you can skip, skip, with a P at the end, um, all the way till the bottom of page 8, from page 1 to page 8 of that article. Uh, excuse me, not to the bottom of page 8, to where it says, on the, towards the top of the page where it says, the coherence of Jewish thought. Um, the first paragraph I marked at 1, the second paragraph I marked at 2, the third paragraph I marked at 3, and then read the next paragraph. So from looking up until the parting of the Red Sea and Korach's fall, uh, those are relatively important. Then, uh, at the bottom, from the word nature, you can skip that to the bottom of page 9, and then uh, where it starts, the preservation of natural resources, the bottom of page 9, uh, skim to page 11, uh, and let's take a look at page 11. Uh, yeah. Actually starting, taking another look at this page 11. Yeah. On page 11, the allocation of space uh, could be considered important that when you're uh, building a nuclear facility, you uh, need to consider uh, having a migrash, an area similar to like the Are Levim, which had a which had an, a space around the city, the purpose of which was for the Levim uh, to graze their animals and for other purposes. So the concept of an allocation of space could possibly be important when you're making a nuclear facility to make sure that you build in to the, uh, into the plan that the residential city does not abut directly up to the facility and that there is a certain amount of space around. Now this idea of having space around a, po uh, uh, a potential hazard we find in other places that was we're going to say. Uh, Uh, from this second next section, contemporary halacha, till the end of the page, skim this. So I'm putting a star by the allocation of space, and then skim on page 11 till the bottom where it says non-religious aspects that you can skip. And then on page 12, the conclusions are important. Uh, and conclusion number one, one approach could be the development of Jewish environmental studies as an academic profession, just as Jewish women's studies has evolved in recent years. These, um, uh, Professor Gersenfeld was uh, offering how to make environmental studies in Judaism more important, that we shouldn't have to do what we've just been doing, is that gleaning from all over the Torah, and that you should actually create a discipline, a course of study, in which all of these various citations and sources in the Torah that describe our relationship to nature should be brought into one place and offered as a focused course of study. That's number one. Number two, a totally different approach could be if people concerned about environment were to put environment questions to rabbinical leaders. There needs to be more she'elot, which would then spawn teshuvot from, the, from chachamim. And not just make the presumption that uh, environmental issues are not halachic and are not something which are to be brought to a bait in. So, this, so the second thing that Professor Gerstenfeld recommends is besides having a focused study, but also more shilas, she'elot, need to be asked. When a nuclear facility is being built, uh, don't avoid asking the Rabbonin about it. Bring it to a basin. Have the, the um, both those who are building it ask Shailas of Chachamim, and also that the residents around need to ask the municipality. Need, involve 
the Chachamim, the Torah leaders, in terms of discussing what are the important issues Torah-wise that must be considered. And let it take it from practicality to uh, take it from theory to practicality by actually studying it and posing questions that would require the writing of responsa, of current contemporary responsa um, on, on uh, these issues. Now, if we skip to the next paper, which is called Development of Environmental, Environmental Halacha by Dr. Gerstenfeld, um, creating, in, on, on page one of that paper, creating an environmental codex. Uh, that would be a third recommendation by Dr. Gerstenfeld, and that is not just to have a, not just to have a focused course of study on environmental issues and not just asking Shilas, but to take all of this information and publish it together in its own volumes so that it could become a course textbook. Uh, now he mentions on page one of this next paper three areas of concern. Baal Tashkit, Tsar that we already discussed, and Hilchot Shechenim. Hilchot Shechenim is very important. The laws of neighborliness, and, and this is very important in building nuclear facilities, any type of power plants, is that you have to consider the effect that the building of the facility will have on the neighborhood and the inhabitants thereof and the, in, and, and the uh, uh, environment. Um, the next paragraph, with regard to the preservation of natural resources, the laws of Shemitah and Yovel, the sabbatical years and jubilee years, provide important measures for preventing erosion and exhaustion of the land. Go to the next page, page two of this paper. Why is the Jewish voice not heard clearly? Why is it that people don't realize that Torah and Judaism speaks loudly and clearly about environmental responsibilities. Number one, there are, the next paragraph, there are few committed Jews. You need more Jews, to, if you're going to give a loud voice to something, you need more Jews who are committed to environment, environmental issues. Number two, there is not a profound course of study in environmental issues, and that needs to be initiated it needs to be expanded. It needs to be supported. And then the third thing, as we already said before, was asking Shalot and Shuvot. Ask. Uh, from the bottom, protection of nature on page two, you can skip that. Till the bottom of page three, the prohibition against hunting. Uh, but at the very bottom of page 3, the law of Kilai and prohibiting change of to the continuity of species is another important example of a law of protection of nature. Today, when there is so much discussion about genetic manipulation, a law for preserving the species as God created them is particularly important. Page 4, animal protection. Uh, just uh, skim that. Contemporary halacha. Uh, we discussed that slightly, uh, but that is important to contemporary lacha, where it talks about tsar balechayim in research. So contemporary halacha on page four. Uh, on page five, uh, where it says from a few years ago that you could. Uh, that you could skip. Uh, pr uh, protection on page five, protection of natural resources, that's important. The next pre uh, section, prevention of nuisance and pollution, that's important. Page six, allocation of space, we already said that that was important. Then at the bottom of page six, where do we go from here? Uh, what's important there is on page seven, uh, in the third in the third paragraph that starts, what other questions could be asked? 
Uh, we are at the very beginning of a lengthy progress, a process. Uh, but look in the next sentence. Should it not be obliga obligatory for the new religious municipalities to have a green migrash around them? Is a religious municipality allowed to plant trees which cause some citizens allergies? How does the halacha deal with saving water and the raising of chickens in close coops tsar balichayim? These questions must be asked before building a facility. So in summary, we don't just build a nuclear facility. Part of the process, I'm not reading, this is something that I wrote. Part of the process is to list issues and ask post scheme the issues. Uh, whether it's a migrash, an area, setbacks, tsar uh, pollution of all types, or an economic benefit that comes out of all of this, these need to be discussed. Now, the next paper is Ecology, a Jewish perspe Perspective by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. Uh, what the nice thing that Rabbi Halevi does is that he brings a, a, uh, a concept and, and then brings a case in point, a, a practical case in point. Um, the first page of his article is important, but on the second page, the problem of over overconsumption that you can skip. Um, the section of the Torah approach is skim that. The next page, damage to neighbors, is important. Um, the next page, a psychological revolution. Just uh, give that a skim. Skim, S-K-I-M. And that's the end of that paper. The next few pages are called a bibliography of sources on Jewish environmental law. We're just going to skim through this very quickly. Just look, the, the, my purpose of showing this to you is, first of all, if you wanted to do some research, it gives you a whole bibliography of sources that you could look at in case you wanted to do a project on your own. But um, the, the, basically you see that the Torah does speak about the importance of safeguarding the environment, the conceptual basis is on the first page, and then followed by some uh, practical legislation uh, in the Torah regarding uh, caring about the environment. And then on the next page, specific rulings that the Torah does speak about doing, you know, being careful about air quality, water quality, soil quality, how you dispose of solid waste, protection of trees and vegetation, animals, urban planning, and that some places require a higher level of environmental quality in Jerusalem and the temple. So we as Jews also honor areas of Kedusha and are particularly sensitive to the environmental needs of that area. Uh, public sanitation. I'm just jumping through these pages. Blessings on natural phenomena is our expression as Jews of recognizing nature as a, uh, a, a, an emanation of God's genius and by honoring nature, by blessing God, we are honoring him with his uh, wisdom. And then some selected Midrashim and sayings of the sages. Uh, of all these pages, I'm not asking you to, uh, to memorize anything. Uh, just uh, skim it through a couple of times and just know that these are areas in w that the Torah speaks to in terms of care of the environment. Now the, the last two pages of this um, large PDF file of the readings of JSC um, are some Mishnayot 
from the second cha uh, chapter of Masechet uh, uh, Bavabatra. Uh, I'm not asking you to um, commit these to memory. Nobody's asking you. These are Mishnayot with, um, with English translation. Uh, skim them. I am not going to ask any specific questions of halacha from the Mishnah. What um, uh, I might ask for some examples if you can remember, but you see that these Mishnayot talk about laws that relate to being careful about the environment. For example, Mishnah 3, um, that you can't put uh, a baker shop or a dyer shop under his fellow storehouse nor a cattle stall because doing so creates um, noxious odors that will destroy, uh, you know, that will, that, that will go into the other person's storehouse and it'll, it'll be a nuisance, uh, especially the way that it might uh, affect uh, the production of wine. Um, also, that Mishnah talks about uh, businesses that create noise and um, what the uh, uh, residents of the area are allowed to protest in terms of noise pollution. Uh, and sometimes they can protest and sometimes they can't protest depending on the type of industry which is, which is held in the vicinity. The fourth Mishnah uh, ha talks about safety, about uh, you know, uh, building walls that will somehow infringe on somebody else's security, either because it makes it easy for animals to jump into the person's house or on the roof, or it causes other people to be able to peer into the person's windows, or it causes another person not to have proper sunlight. All of these, that whenever you're building a type of facility, you have to concern about how it affects other people's uh, living. Uh, the next, uh, the, the, end of, the end of that Mishnah uh, and, uh, talks about uh, when you uh, gain a, a, a threshing floor such that the, there might be pollution from the leftover uh, straw which blows in the air and might blow into people's houses. So you have to put a setback of 50 cubits. Again, whenever you're installing a facility, you have to consider, about, you have to consider the residents around. That's also in Mishnah 9. Uh, graves, carcasses, uh, tanneries, again, have to be kept 50 cubits. Um, and also, what side of the city? You have to consider the way the wind blows. Again, all that he's talking about, all of these are issues that have to be considered whenever you're building a facility, even if it's a facility to provide needed resource of energy, but it also you have to consider these issues of the livability of the environment. Uh, also, in the ten, the tenth Mishnah, uh, you know, growing things next to stuff that other people are growing, how the two, uh, you know, the two crops might affect each other. All right, we're going to go over this one page which I sent out to you. It's it's all in Hebrew. Uh, it says Devarim Perikhaf Pasuk Yutet, which is the argument between Rashi and the Ramban and the Ibn Ezra concerning the violation of cutting down fruit trees during the siege um, of a city. At, at the very beginning, you have the source verse in Devarim Perikhaf Pasuk Yutet Ki Tatsur Alir Yamim Rabim Lachem Alel Tovsa Lo Tashchit Atay Sal Lindoach Alav Garzen Ki Mimenu Tochel Veyotov Lo Tichrot Ki Adam Meitz Hasadel Lovomi Panach B'Matzor. That if you siege a city for a long time to bring it down, don't destroy its trees because you eat from them, and you are not to cut them down. Uh, is man a tree that will stand up to you in a siege? So Rashi says, the very next thing is Rashi, Ki ha'adam eitzasadeh, Shema adam eitzasadeh, is the tree of the field a person, the kaneis betocha matzor mi panecha, that will stand up to you in a siege, lehit yasir b'yisurei rav v'tzama kanshe ayir, that you have to 
somehow make this tree suffer with 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 hunger and uh, you know with, with hunger and and thirst like people lamatashkitanu why destroy it so it does appear from the word, or words of Rashi is that the tree is not involved in the conflict and accordingly don't include the tree into the conflict like you're trying to include the inhabitants of the city. Don't cut it down. Okay, the, the, the obvious question would be according to Rashi is then why are you allowed to cut down non-fruit trees because there's also not involved in the conflict. Now the next one we have the Ramban. And uh, we could, um, let's just skip down to where it says, V'hata'am, the reason. V'hata'am ki ha'nilchamim mashchitim ba'ir, because those who are fighting against the city are destroying the city. V'saviv ha'aretz ulai yuchlula. Okay, it means mashchitim ba'ir v'saviv ha'aretz ulai yuchlula. They are destroying the city and the surroundings to the city because maybe then they can take over. Ke'inyan she'ne'emar, similarly as it's written in Malachim Bet, Peregimel, Pasuk Yutet, V'chol Eitz Tov Tapilu, V'chol Mayanei Mayim Tistamu. Make sure to cut down every good tree and um, and to stop up every water source. I don't know exactly the the, uh, the context that was talking about, but apparently when you try to take off the city, you cut off the water source and cut down the trees. But you, Jewish person, don't do the same thing to destroy it. Have um, confidence in God that he will give the city into your hands if you follow the laws of the Torah. So the way the Ramban explains the Pasuk, Ki ha'adam it's a declaration, a statement, it's not a question. A man is a tree of the field because he eats from it. Uvo tavo ha'ir mipanecha and what does it mean? Even if you're trying to bring the city down, you are going to be able to use this tree to live. You will live from this tree after you've conquered the city. So therefore, while you are still encamped around the city, you should do the same thing and not destroy the tree. You need this tree to eat from during the course of the siege. And after the siege is over, when, the, when God has given this uh, city into your hands, you will eat from the tree. So the Ramban actually says a couple of things here. Um, number one, he says that you need to have bitachon bashem. You have to trust in God that if you that not everything, you cannot employ everything in the nature to your use. If God tells you not to destroy an element of nature, then you should have confidence that by, by disciplining yourself and not giving in to your desire to destroy that tree for the, for the war effort, then God will repay you for his service in that respect by keeping that mitzvah by giving the by by giving the city over to you, you'll conquer it, and you won't have to destroy the tree. And the next thing is, is because people eat the tree, and the trees make up the human society by feeding it, and you'll be able to retain that tree and eat from it after the war is over. The Ibn Ezra says, if we go down. Uh, let's let's skip down to where it says umedakdek gedol sfardi amar, which it says umedakdek gedol sfardi. It's the last line. It's right under ulafi dati, where it starts off vehatam. It's the next line vehatam. The reason is ki ben adam who eats a sadeh. The life of a person is based upon a tree, meaning, ki nefesh hu 
why is it that you're not allowed to take as collateral either to top or bottom grindstone is because by taking a grindstone you're taking away a person's life now a grindstone is not a person's life but the grindstone is what the person's life needs by, by taking a grindstone as collateral, you're taking away that person's life source. So he explains, Ki ven adam hu a person's life source is a tree. That's the meaning of the Pasuk. Um, so you can actually see in the words of the Ibn Ezra, similar to what the Ramban is saying, that trees are ingredients that make up humans. So when you look at nature, and see how humans benefit, you can then view nature as a component of humanity just like that person's limbs. A tree is like a limb of a, a human being, or at least it's a component part of a human being.